I won't <coughs> go into my story. Um, in the past, we always had Howard offer a blessing to start, and we're going to do it again, because we realized it just slipped away. So Howard, will you come and start, and then I'll do the introductions. And it's really good to see all of you. Thank you for coming. It's a gift. Okay, you're on. Okay. Okay. Be careful, though, we got No, you're not going to go up there. <laughs> Howard, stay up. Okay. I, 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 I just feel more comfortable do, doing okay. it from some, some high, 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 high position. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've seen the, the pulpits in, in Lutheran churches and Muslim mosques, and they're quite elevated. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, our, our, our Father in Heaven, we, 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 we thank you for the privilege of re resuming these, these salons. We thank you for, for those who Try to try to do your 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 work in the art world, and and uh, and, and may make a make a uh, a silent witness that overturns uh, you know thrills and powers and false identities. We th thank you for all the people we've been able to assemble t today, and we ask that you would guide, guide this conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, pray, Howard, and that is the black jacket. Well done. <laughs> he told me he was dressing in Halloween colors. So yeah. anyway, but he, you know it is dark navy black blue and now that blue. I look. Okay, <laughs> we have to work on your closet, Howard. But there's not been a lot of time. Anyway, it's great to see you, and I'm excited about the show. I just saw it for the first time today. So uh, first, we're going to start with a conversation led by. Jonathan Anderson, who is the only person I have to introduce, um, with artists whose work is in the show and with a curator who has curated many of these artists and uh, worked with many of them. So um, Jonathan, is, who is on my left, um, is, has, has recently completed his, uh, his PhD at King's College, University of London, and he is now a postdoctoral associate of theology and visual arts at Duke University. He is also an artist, and I think you've been in a show or two here. Your work, <laughs> not you. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, you, we, we didn't, you know, display you. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and, uh, and he uh, taught for uh, 13 years, I think, at Biola University in the art department, and is uh, working toward his uh, dissertation being published. Uh, his book, that he co-wrote with William Durness um, was, uh, I'll give the whole title, Modern Art and the Life of a Culture, The Religious Impulses of Modernism, which was a, uh, a courageous book, actually, um, and, and also broke a lot of ground that had been lying fallow for a long time. Um, and it was named one of the best books of 2016 by Image Journal. Um, he, has, he has an essay in the, uh, in the journal, in the, what, let me get the whole title right here. It's in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Religion, which is if you're a scholar, you really want to be in that. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's an entry on modern art, the invisibility of theology and contemporary criticism. And um, Jonathan is a delight to read. He did a salon for us earlier this year. He, he actually opened the season, Howard, in September. And now we're going to hand it over to him to uh, take it from here. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you, Roberta, and all of you uh, for, for being here. It's, it's really a joy to uh, be in conversation with the people to my left. I'm really looking forward to it. So the, the occasion for this conversation is the exhibition that is opening tonight in the gallery called Making a Mark which is curated by John Silvis, who is uh, over here, uh, and we'll be hearing from him later on, uh, at, right before the opening. So this will be a kind of a, a front-loading of the exhibition to some extent, and, and thinking through the topic of the general topic of the exhibition, which is abstraction um, in contemporary art. Um, and, so, uh, and so because the organizing principle of the exhibition is contemporary abstract, uh, visual art, um, 
Uh, it provides us a, a chance to think through that topic with people who know uh, and are quite thoughtful about that subject. Um, and, and so that's what we'll explore together. So I want to begin by introducing our panelists briefly, um, and, and then we'll uh, dive in. Uh, so I'll introduce all of them, and then we can uh, recognize them all together, clap at, clap at the end. Uh, so Christine will appear to get quite a lot of applause. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, immediately to my left is Jennifer Gross. She's an art historian and curator of modern and contemporary art. She was formerly the uh, founding executive director of Hauser and Wirth Institute. Uh, she was the chief curator and deputy director of curatorial affairs at De Cordova Sculpture Park and Medium and the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at Yale University Art Gallery. It's so good to have you uh, with us. Um, uh, next to her is Linnea Gabriella Spranzi. Uh, she's an artist who's exhibited at galleries such as White Flag and Rona Hoffman Gallery and several others, and uh, also at academic, institution, uh, academic institutions, including Princeton and Duke University. Um, <laughs> Uh, and has done collaborative projects in New York, London, and Scotland. She studied, at, uh, uh, studied art at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design and received her MFA from Yale University, which uh, here is where you uh, two met. Yep. Um, and currently she lives and works in LA where for the past three years she has co-directed Bridge Projects, which is a gallery uh, many of you probably know something about. Linnea, it's great to have you here. Glad to be here. Uh, next to Linnea is Carl Berg. Carl Berg is a curator and gallery director, as well as a conceptual artist who works in a variety of media. He has owned galleries in Los Angeles and Amsterdam, and is uh, currently the founder director of Project LA, which is a new alternate gallery in downtown Los Angeles, um, and really has been a, a, a kind of force in the LA art world for a number of years. Um, he's worked as a curator organizing over 150 exhibitions in Los Angeles, Berlin, Seoul, Amsterdam, Berlin, Rotterdam, and elsewhere. Carl, it's really good to have you here. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, Christine Turner is a Los Angeles-based artist. She graduated with her MFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago in 2020, earning the Carrie Ellen Tuttle Fellowship in Painting. Uh, her work has been exa exhibited at uh, several galleries, including Roberts Projects in Los Angeles, Green Gallery in Milwaukee, Elmhurst Art Museum in Chicago, and others. Christine and all of the panelists, it's so good to have you join me. Welcome. Thank you. So our our topic is um, is is uh, especially large. Uh, if we take <laughs> abstraction as the topic, which is itself a kind of contested word, I, I, I would guess, um, going under a number of other uh, names. But abstraction, we'll take that as our kind of heuristic word uh, for, for our topic, has quite a history to it. I mean, it's been going strong the way that we uh, think about it in, in uh, terms of modernist painting, modernist art, has been going strong for at least 100 years. Um, and of course has a long uh, history of precedence before that uh, through really uh, kind of almost every culture <laughs> uh, uh, prior to the 20th century had abstract modes of uh, thinking and mark making and so forth. Um, so I, I want to see if we can give, um, provide for ourselves and others a kind of uh, way into thinking about abstraction as a general topic. Um, so I'm, I want to start with a, a, a really kind of broad question that is what is a, a helpful point of reference or frame of reference that, uh, that you think is helpful for thinking about abstraction today, the ways that it works um, the contexts that are imp important to you. You don't have to say everything about that subject, obviously. Take a particular uh, um, uh, point of view on it. But whether it's, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and I should say, especially contemporary abstraction. I mean, so I've already said it has a long history, but the uh, show or the work in this show 
is all, except for two works, is all within the last 10 years, and especially the last two to three years, most of it is. So it's quite a, it's quite a look into contemporary abstraction. So what's a, uh, maybe provide one way in for us, how you think about abstraction as a, as a mode of art making that um, uh, is important, significant, relevant to uh, the lives we live. And for, just to get us going, maybe I'll start with Sorry. you, Jennifer, <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> and go, yeah. So um, I think one of the continuing uh, gifts of abstraction to audiences um, is so when artists are, are, I guess, more focused even when creating abstract works, the conclusion of their exercise, their series of questions that they're asking themselves as they are approaching their medium or even a, um, I wouldn't necessarily say a topic, but an inquiry, is that um, the concluding work doesn't have an answer for its audience, which is usually something we're pretty uncomfortable with as an audience. And so uh, they're inviting us into a, an exercise of being comfortable with the unknown, I would say, in a, um, because they're often in their studios. Um, the vehicle of, and, and commitment of making art is, is primarily an action of questions uh, different than the rest of what we do as human beings, which is we make productive and useful things in the world mm -hmm. and do productive and useful things. But art's not that useful um, in its, its final mm -hmm. format. Uh, but they're inviting us to participate in that by not delivering an answer in the work. They're inviting us into their process. Um, and so I guess that would be my yeah, good. answer there. Yeah, good. Um, I've, even as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I had a question, I had a reply that I will now share with you, but I also am feeling that there is an additional section to it. So first I would say that a lot of artists, when they choose abstraction as appropriate to what they want to say, um, many times in the kind of inner churning of their own work and creativity and that sort of mechanism, they're wanting to have an experience that's different or in some way um, entirely motivated by something that they've seen in the world that's quirky or, or um, anomalous or captures their fascination. And so a lot of times they're trying to give themselves an experience that is kind of arises from that. Um, so in my case, I make procedural work, the vast majority of my work that's abstract um, is about laying out really strict limitations for myself, and I want to give myself an experience of, of having extreme restraint and still experiencing surprise. So that's sort of a unique experience um, that I can condense in the studio and within the frame of you know, a canvas, although sometimes my drawings get to be quite large and are cut out and are sort of freeform. So it doesn't always have to be contained in the canvas. But I'd also say, so that's one thing that I feel is quite true of a lot of artists that are abstract and think abstractly. I'd also say that given the fact that abstraction and the way that we recognize it is relatively recent, 100 years is, mm. while in one sense yeah. quite long, in another quite yeah. minuscule, yeah. I would say that um, in the last hundred years, the human race has been confronted with more that is strange and unrecognizable than we ever have been before. And in some ways, you could argue that abstraction is a means of processing and familiarizing ourselves with what is strange and unfamiliar, um, even just in a visual plane. Um, so that's, those are two of my replies. Good, thank you. Uh, I guess it's my turn, yeah. Um, I think uh, current abstraction artists who, who make abstract work have, have a tough time because um, when you think about the early uh, artists like Mondrian, Kandinsky, they evolved their work from more realistic work into abstraction. They were sort of the first to do that and so they're thinking about how to go from this to that is part of process and I think today people you know already know what abstract art looks like so we've known that for quite a while so the impetus I think from that time to now is, is different because of 
the precedent of, of all these artists from Mondrian to Pollock to m many others. And so the artists now have to look in different ways to create abstract paintings that aren't derivative, uh, have meaning, and I, I think it's, it's not easy. And I think that often, you know, process can help that, to c come up with new ways of thinking of how to, to mold the work uh, and, and create new patterns and rhythms and ideas. Um, so I think, you know, it's quite difficult uh, <coughs> for contemporary artists really to delve into, uh, and, and that's true even outside of abstraction. So you have this, this challenge for the young artists, and even the mature artists, to make new things, new exciting processes, to, to come up with something visually interesting and compelling for the, for, for the viewer to look at. So, um, and that may full flow into the next question, but mm. I'm finishing now, so. Mm -hmm. I think um, my perspective echoes what Jennifer was saying, where um, abstraction, for me, the way I understand it, is that it's coming from a position of mystery and an attempt to see anew. And while all art does that to some extent, um, to me, that's like what is most interesting about abstraction, and even particularly thinking about how all of us have variations in the way that our eyes function and have different ability. And so for me, uh, abstraction is not, abstraction and representation are not um, binary things to me, but more uh, simply like a, a new way of viewing what is already within the world and sitting with it in, a, in an attitude of mystery or curiosity and acknowledging um, what we're unable to see or and trying to perceive anew. Yeah, good. That's that's really interesting and and sets up some I think a, a really interesting conversation here. I mean, so there is a there's a way of talking about abstraction as as being um, having very much to do with the unknown, the um, the um, uh, the new, I suppose. But there is a way of thinking about abstraction that you're getting at that's kind of, it's not opposed to representation, but it is a way, if, if painting, if we take painting as one of our examples, if painting is a mode of visual spatial thinking, um, abstraction might be one way of kind of slowing it down and, uh, and, I mean, maybe speeding it up in some ways, but making it more basic in some ways. The, the relations between verticality and horizontality, center and periphery, matte and glossy, bright and dull, so forth. The, the grammar of spatial relations, visual relations, kind of s slowing us down on those kinds of relational thinking um, rather than, uh, um, as opposed to a, a painting where we see it and we instantly think that's a person in a field, sort of slows us down to the more basic relations. And that strikes me as possibly a way of thinking about all sorts of other relations. Uh, um, that there might be a kind of ethic to abstract painting um, that's built into the aesthetics. <laughs> what do you all think of, about that as we kind of have a, uh, I think maybe, may, maybe not disagreement, but sort of some different, uh, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, I think your comment actually raises an interesting question, is, is that there's really not a polarized experience. Uh, I think we should, we may need to, separate the artist's experience of abstraction from the audience's. So you are actually speaking to the audience's yes. approach to the resolution of a process, yeah. um, a one-note end, which perhaps becomes, after it's finished, the least interesting part to the artist, but you guys can disagree with me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so uh, there's not so much of a polarized difference, I'm making a general statement, mm. between abstraction and representation. For the yeah. artists, they're, they may have a starting point of a representational mm. uh, source, um, but for them, the representational painter, generally speaking, is, is following a whole series of process decisions yep. as the abstract yep. painter would That's be right. also. Yep. Um, Okay, should I stop there? No, keep going. You're, yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
So the delivery of, an, uh, again, an image at the end of that process um, is, is not what the abstractionist shares perhaps as fluidly as the representational artist, because it's not the representational painter's fault that um, the audience comes to a conclusion about what they were motivated or doing in yeah. making their work. Yeah. Sometimes it's more clear in a whole body of, of paintings. Um, but because uh, we pared down or are able to pare down abstraction to, uh, it, it's a process, it's more clearly a process driven in terms of the kind of decisions mm -hmm. you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. So glossy, matte, um, sometimes there's fewer, there's a, a smaller vocabulary of elements in the yeah. creation of the work, mm -hmm. not necessarily as we see in some of the works here, but um, the, the slowing down part is, um, in fact, it is one of the, the aspects that abstraction can deliver us into uh, a more conscious realization of the time and place experience, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are looking at the work, we can look at the works that are here in this room, and um, we are rather than thinking beyond what we're seeing because we've touched stone to something else being delivered, we are in fact looking for those relative relationships mm -hmm. which are closer to what the artists were maybe in making the work. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Can, can I ask you what you mean by an ethic? Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so I suppose uh, if, if, uh, if art, um, the, the potential that art can attune us to relations Oh, the way that yeah. things are related, um, uh, whether that's, I mean, in art, it's visual relations, but that re relations then become um, a model or a site where we think about relationality as such, um, potentially. Um, whether that is spatial relations or temporal relations or interpersonal relations, Mm -hmm. uh, so that is pushing us toward ethic, not, not an ethics that is like, you know, a, a kind of uh, really determinant kind of ethic, but that there's so, so maybe one way to put it, that our perception of um, balance or lack of balance in mm -hmm. an artwork might have something to do with the way that we think about balance and fairness so and that's western rightness. philosophy right so that's yeah. taking out of the equation a chance process to create an abstract work well that, i mean no chance can be part of can be ethical could yeah sure <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. That. Well, yeah it, it's interesting to the extent we it, live with chance yeah, yeah it okay. feels like answering that um i have to almost answer that like separately as an artist and then as a potential yeah. viewer yeah. because um, I don't know how aware I can be of those things while I'm making. Can't. Can't at Shouldn't all. Shouldn't be. There's a, there's <laughs> a kind of necessary um, numbness to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that assessment can come in once it's reached some kind of stasis, perhaps. But often it's just not that, it's not energizing, it's not the motivator for uh, a person who makes. Yeah. Um, but it, I recognize when I go to a museum or I go to another artist's exhibition with a sense of expectation and hope, yeah. it's so that I can basically be scrambled mm -hmm. and, and have some benefit from being rearranged yeah. in my expectations, like you were saying about relations. Yeah. Um, and be able to see the world in a fresh way. Like the most ef effective artists for me in exhibitions I've ever attended, I've left feeling like a certain, like a layer of my skin has been yeah. shed. Yeah. And I'm new to the world yeah. in, a new, in a fresh way. And, it, and I feel like that is some of what you're getting at. Yeah. But I don't get, it's a different thing for me as a as a viewer. I can experience that, and I go in hope that that will happen. Yeah, Good. many times crestfallen at the end, but on yes. occasion, <laughs> yes, you know. And so, um, but and then in the studio, there are those occasional moments where you step back from the the fervor of making a thing, and you don't recognize it. It's like yeah. someone else, something yeah. else made this. Yeah. And that's an also an, almost yes. like an ethic or a rearrangement yeah. of yeah. expectation yeah. Yeah. relations. 
So um, I, I guess something that was said earlier about we have the viewer and, and, the, and the artist in the process. And I, th I think in abstraction, the process of making you know, and the materials used are so much part of the outcome. I, I think more so than, let's say, in a figurative painting, because the material is what tells the story. Mm -hmm. And so I find that a lot of abstract artists are you know, constantly experimenting with different kinds of media, different kinds of paints. And it's very important, you know, what they use, how they use it to come to a certain conclusion. And uh, I, I go to a lot of studios, so I see a lot of processes. I've curated many exhibitions, and I find it very interesting uh, in terms of how artists try to tackle this style of art that can't be sort of led by a narrative. So you kind of make it out there. And so in order to make something fresh and new, uh, the artists seek new ways of presenting color, whatever texture, all these different things. Scale it could be many different things. And I think that's kind of what I like about abstraction is that there's a constant need for experimentation. And, and it, it's very open-ended. You know, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the interpretation, but I think yeah. there is still something they're trying to say, and it's very important. Uh, and I think the work that I, in abstraction that I find most interesting is that tells that that story in in a new and fresh way, as it would be in a figurative painting or any other kind of painting. So yeah. it just has a different set of rules to how it gets there. Yeah. 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 Um, I am thinking about this morning I went and saw the Rebecca Morris show at the Institute um, of Contemporary Art in downtown LA and that show I was obviously aware that we were going to have this uh, conversation later on but I walking into that space as a viewer her surfaces specifically are so sparse and I think that's a little bit getting to your original question or point John um, where there's such an editing down of information when we're looking at many abstract paintings. And with Rebecca Morris's work specifically, it's amazing as a viewer how it forces you to, like Linnea's saying, shed a layer of skin, particularly when it's working well, and um, forces you to suddenly become more quiet and present if you allow yourself to be, and more in tune with what's happening in the room. And I think with her work specifically, um, it functions so well as an abstract work because it causes you to be in tune with your body within the space. And then also like the marks that are on the ground because many of like the cracks that are in this similar like w waxed cement floor end up appearing on um, the works in her canvases. And so I think there's an interesting element with abstract work where you it can be written off as decorative, but then also at the same time, there's a way that it forces you to not have as many assumptions about what you are perceiving and like acquiring knowledge about. There's a way that it um, causes you to become so attentive and in, in a way that I find really mimics uh, poetry, where you have to become radically stilled and radically um, quieted to it. And I also think that it ends up becoming not that easy to digest as a digital image, particularly on Instagram, where mm -hmm. the art world now lives on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I have like a lot of abstract painter friends who will say that they you know, don't have as much of a following or whatever as a figurative <laughs> artist, because it is less able to be quickly digested. And a lot of that like nuance and attention to surface and detail and space um, obviously is lost in like a smaller image. Um, yeah, but. good, good, good. I'm, I mean, that, um, uh, yes, this, so I, I think um, uh, the, uh, that's a really important way that abstract art making works, that it, it slows down, it stills, but there's such a, a range of things as well, a, a plurality 
that um, abstract painting can be uh, very much about accumulation and chaos, agitation, whimsy, um, uh, the, the concrete, the ephemeral, and so on. Uh, it is, I, I, think, I think abstract art um, deals with something very important about the ordering of vision and thus the ordering of the world to some extent. That's what I'm getting at with the that hope, ethic the thing. Hope. The hope. The and, hope. <laughs> and also like just experimenting, what, do, what is, how do grids, like what's the logic of a grid? What's the logic of, of an organism visually? What's the logic of sparseness, erasure, uh, accumulation, um, degradation? Like all of those things, it's a, it's a kind of slowing down on those over, I'm saying slowing down, maybe that's not the right word, but slowing down over those kind of orderings of our visual world. Does that, is that maybe a better way of putting the word uh, rather than ethic? <laughs> work. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. It's open. Yeah. Okay. So as to not um, uh, let this conversation be overly abstract, um, I do want to kind of uh, uh, look at some of the works that are in the show and kind of give a, a bit of a preview to the, to the work and have each of you talk about one, maybe two of the works. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll put the images on the screen so you get some idea of what we're uh, talking about. But then, of course, you'll see the works in person. So this is a kind of taster. And hopefully, we can give each other some kind of like point of entry for uh, one work, explore how one work works. Um, and I have asked Linnea and Christine to talk about their own works because they're both in this show. So they're not just self-serving when they talk about their own works, they're directed to. <laughs> okay. uh, Jennifer, do you want to uh, start? Okay, great. And, I'll and I don't know start which show. Okay. We'll start with Heather. So um, I don't know if you all, when you first came in the lobby of the building that Heather Day's painting was there, it's not in this back room. And then the next work as well, um, so uh, I, I picked these two works to uh, speak about because they're so direct as abstractions. They're remarkably satisfying in terms of our general understanding of uh, a procedure in abstraction. Um, they're both of a good, uh, one of the interesting things about abstraction, which is kind of a new, newish thought to myself in writing about art is just a few years ago, uh, I was asked to write about a figurative painter, which was sort of really out of my wheelhouse. Um, and it made me go into, it was a figurative artist who at the very end of their life through um, Asian and experience in Japan ended up um, releasing himself from a remarkable gift as a draftsman. He, had, he was just an incredibly skilled artist in terms of rep re representing the world. Mm. And it became a handicap in his, his creative process as an artist because he was so skilled. And he never got beyond it, but he had a, he had a severe health incident, um, became, uh, went to Japan, and came out of it and was freed um, from that and became, began making abstract paintings. And um, they became a, a natural vehicle for him and he, he produced these paintings that were on size to the human body. And a lot of abstraction um, are either there within yeah. the scope of our, our sort of human core, so that when we look at them, and you'll see the works, we direct them, we directly engage them. And then on large scale, um, like Liliana's work, which is, is large scale. And this was a gift of abstract expressionism, like art mm -hmm. scaled way up through painting, and it became a gift um, or maybe a curse in the art world, because our expectation as an audience was to be fully embraced by whatever we encountered. Installation, it also, there was a crossover between music and dance, and, and the, the human body had been recognized beyond our visual capacities, and in fact, um, we come to expect this a lot from abstraction in particular, but also from art overall. Um, but these two paintings are just remarkably um, uh, great abstract paintings. They are resolved in terms of the space that we are invited to enter into. There's a gift of, of, of a physical space that we are looking into, but because our body is, is drawn to them and they recognized um, in the, the resolution of the work, this completion of a balance of space and form and gesture and a color palette, um, 
we are able to be there and be um, uh, honored mm -hmm. and um, have the pleasure of this work. And I consider that a remarkable accomplishment in my experience of both of those paintings mm -hmm. and as a, um, a baseline to a lot of other kinds of experience I had. There's paintings in the show that are very quick to the eye that actually are not about our body, but our eye moves across the surface and then we get to thinking about some other things that are going on in these paintings, but these do that. Yeah, lovely, yeah, okay. good. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Linnea, you have yeah. two paintings in the show. I only have one on the screen, but you yeah. can you know, this, talk about both of them. This is actually a detail shot, so it's not Oh dear. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, so <laughs> my work, Maybe, maybe I'm sneaking in a little bit and um, stretching the definition of abstraction <laughs> somehow, in some ways. Am I entirely within the bounds of abstraction with these works? That's a live question. Um, because we see recognizable images and they're very specific images um, from a late medieval text called Aris Murundi. First appeared, it's now a genre of literature. It first appeared in 1450 just as the printing press was starting to um, dawn. And this was a manual initially entirely in Latin about how to die well. And in that era, um, few knew that the zenith of the bubonic plague was actually passed be because it still would periodically ravage and decimate whole populations. So death was everywhere. Death was sudden and uh, indiscriminate. And uh, so this manual, initially in Latin, very quickly was translated into images. That was the language that could hurdle over uh, a kind of ignorance um, and uh, the fact that most of the population couldn't read. So um, these 11 images became incredibly popular. There were 50,000 copies made in that early, early era, which is astounding. You have to understand, this is like as the printing press was just coming online. <laughs> um, and you could argue that um, this was a foundational text in the West, contemporary Western experience. Um, and I love that it is a series of illustrations about how to die well. Looking at these images as a contemporary person, they are very strange and they are no longer as transparent as they were once to most people. Um, and I find that migration of meaning very interesting. So this is um, some background about the actual images that you're seeing in this abstract work that I've made. Um, I came to these images through my friend Lydia Dugdale and I found them to be a kind of historic and narrative match to a lot of the pursuits I had as an abstract artist, where I'm very interested in the potential of limitation to actually create new experience. Mm -hmm. And a limitation that all of us face is mortality. And we are facing it now, given climate change and a lot of other forms of fear and panic in our world, on a level that um, feels it feels, um, well, it makes many of us feel that we have no power in the world, <laughs> have no way of facing it. And so I started really thinking, surely this is not the first time in human history that people have felt this. And how did they respond in the past? Mm. And I wanted to um, kind of meld these two languages that I found a resonance between. Um, and so I approach my abstract work with a really kind of precise procedure. And I started treating these images as though they were movable type, as though they were an abstract element like anything else in my work. And um, there is technically within every piece, there's every element can be put back together to replicate the original R.S. Murundi image. But they're scattered throughout the abstraction. So there's layers upon layers, and there's a certain number of layers where they're wedged in there. But technically, the whole image is there. The whole representation is there. But it's blown apart. And that's something that 
again, I feel is, is very um, familiar to our experience of history and certainly of these ways of engaging with the world that were so typical in the, in the Middle Ages, um, as in once the world was an enchanted place and uh, no longer do, we, do most people in the West think it, but we are all haunted by it. Um, so there's many things that I feel like I could say about this work, but I am doing 11 pieces, 11, um, yeah, 11 in the series, each one directly quoting one of the 11 Arnest Burundi pieces. So these are two of them. It's pride and humility. Um, and you can guess which is which. <laughs> you can also ask me. <laughs> So when you see the work, you'll see what she's talking yeah. about. But just as point of clarification, so uh, the works that Jennifer talked about are probably broadly referred to as gestural yes. paintings. The artist's movements are, are sort of uh, on the surface of the painting. Uh, um, your works might initially appear gestural, but they're not gestural at all. Can you say a little bit, you, you mentioned procedure. Your work is procedural rather yeah. than gestural. Can you yeah. say just a bit more about what your procedures are, what they look yeah. like? Yes. Um, how much time, time do we Well, have? not <laughs> much. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so the, my, my, abs my strictly abstract work, which, what is this? I think it is abstract work, but um, ones that you don't even have fragments of representation in them. Um, are built using very simple visual, I call them modules, and you can, they can build on top of one another and they have meaningful relationships with each other so that they can accumulate to something, to an image. And I use basic numbers to build their accumulations and I decide before I begin every piece how many times those cycles of growth will occur um, I involve chaotic, destructive events that um, are cycles of growth and destruction, and I decide how many of those will occur beforehand. And I know, and this is going to sound familiar to some of you, I know the end from the beginning in every one of my pieces. So there's a godlike posture that I do have. But it's such a different experience. It's a one mode of knowing to have all of these rules in my head. It's another mode of knowing to follow it through and to have the experience and to be surprised and to step back at the end and say, well, I could not have known this unless I went through the knowing of doing. Yeah. Yeah. There's a knowing of planning and there's a knowing of doing. I'm interested in those two knowings. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. And there's probably an analogous way of knowing that we could talk about with gestural. Yes. Yeah, as well. and I appreciate that they end up reading as gestural. Yeah, good. I think yeah. that that's satisfying to me and another yeah. unexpected thing, yeah. so I will be quiet now. Lovely, they're lovely. Uh, Carl, did you want to pick a, a work from the show? Yes, yes there was. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is a, a piece that you really need to look at when you go to the gallery because um, there are details in the piece that kind of reveal the process. Um, and, and so these are made uh, by a dripping ink. Um, so each of the lines are created by the, a tool. An artist is right here, Tim. <laughs> and he, uh, he, ma he makes <laughs> tools often to create his artwork. And so it drips the ink, and then it goes down. And then when, when I was asking him at the studio, I said, well, how do you stop the drip? And he comes with another tool, <laughs> and it's a little vacuum. <laughs> and so he's created a system for making these yeah. uh, sort of linear yeah. abstract works. Uh, and uh, just the idea of it, I, I think, fascinates yeah. me. Yeah. That, that we were talking earlier about it. I said I would lead to process and how yeah. that's so important. Yeah. For, for many abstract artists, is to invent a new system to make an artwork. Yeah. And uh, they're really fantastic. And yeah. they, uh, they're in a way performative. Uh, there's a video online that you can see where it's kind of sped up of him making these works. Uh, and then people may ask, well, 
if he's stripping the ink, how do, you know, they're going in different directions. How does he deal with that? Well, Tim created a huge Lazy Susan that he can spin in the studio to, to create the different directions that the, that the ink would flow. And, but what's really important, I think mostly it's an incredible process and it's incredibly effective at the way it, the result. But, but I think what's even more important about it is that it, it, you, I can recognize it yeah. as, as a Tim Hawkinson. He has a huge <laughs> genre of art making from huge sculptures, small sculptures, things made out of fingernails. You can, it covers the, the whole range. But, but uh, for him to, again, come up with another way to make an artwork mm -hmm. and have it function right into the, the depth of, of, of an abstract work that you would think that this was someone that was doing this for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. that, that's what marvels uh, me about these works. And, I think uh, they're very special, and yeah. he's going. He, I think he's done with doing those. So whatever there is, there is, and he's moving on to something else. But he'll, he'll only he can really answer that. He may do it again. <laughs> but he, he actually started doing these, but they weren't abstract. It, it was a piece that I showed that was a big uh, was a windmill and a light tower and a, I think a water wheel, and and then at a certain point he made the decision to make a range of works, you know, where I think he did over 30, 40 of these. Um, and I think that's one of the few times he's ever made so many works the same way. But this process, I think, really caught him mm -hmm. and it became this thing about an exercise and, and, and trying to do it in different ways. And they, there's many different ways that he approached, you know, some are denser, some are more figurative than others. There, there is a figurative relationship in these works that comes through in, in a number of them. But uh, I suggest uh, look them up online, see more of them, mm -hmm. and you'll you'll see yeah. you know the variety and and and, and look at look for that video because the <laughs> the video is, is great. And I think Tim has somewhere online he has it. Uh, we'll we'll yeah. have to ask him, right? uh, which it's on YouTube I think. And, and there's such a wonderful kind of internal friction to these works in the sense that this, the visual language is one of almost sort of timeless order. Like that's the kind of vernacular of this kind of abstract painting. Um, there's no time passing in the work. And yet each one is this fragile, fragile uh, line created through gra by gravity that is temporal. It's bit, I mean, it suddenly seems so fragile and, um, and temporal. I, I, I love that about those words. Uh, anyway, thank you, Carl. And Christine, i uh, love to hear you talk about your work in the show. Yeah, so I um, made this work three years ago, and it was during the first year of my MFA program. Um, and during that time, I was uh, mostly making sort of abstracted landscapes that were also more like emotional, psychological landscapes or interior spaces. And so I was using um, memories of experiences of being present in the landscape. Um, I think this one in particular, I was thinking more about um, experiences by my parents' pawns at the time. And I was the first year of my MFA was a time of a lot of uh, angst and upheaval because you're constantly um, being asked to renegotiate all aspects of the ways that you think about art and the ways that you're making and reconfiguring. And so that ended up translating into a lot of the work I was making that year where there's a lot of imagery of um, sort of claustrophobia and um, churning that's happening and like tiny windows uh, kind of going through a thicket or something like that. And so I think in this piece in particular, there's a lot of uh, maybe slightly more recognizable forms than maybe some of my other work where there's like elements of maybe a bark or a sunset that's been subverted mm -hmm. or um, some like water moving through um, uh, reeds or weave, weeds. Um, yeah. Oh. Do they begin from observation in any way, or is it more? Um... Yeah, so I, f I found that um, 
the way that I was most intuitively interested in working was from memory. And then I ended up uh, actually in undergrad learning about the um, Song Dynasty painters who were all about being present um, within the landscape and observing everything, not actually making any marks or uh, mm -hmm. painting from observation out in the landscape, but that they would be present and that they would go back to their studio and from that uh, place of memory and then also spontaneity create their work. And so for me, that was a, a mode of making that I found to be the most um, meaningful. And at this time, that was still what I was, uh, you know, working through and working towards. Yeah. Lovely. Well, that's quite a range. I mean, I think that's actually a really kind of wonderful, uh, instructive range of works, uh, laying out what some of what um, uh, abstract art making is doing today and capable of. Yeah, good. I think um, we've come to the end. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, without uh, uh, comments from, from you all and questions. So do please, if you have uh, comments or questions for uh, any of these uh, lovely people, please do um, uh, uh, come and ask. Come and talk to them. Oh, do you want, do you, oh, we, we're okay. Okay, all right, then let's do Q&A. Uh, so if you have any comments or questions, would love to hear them, they can be would you evening. say that abstraction is a notion that stands on its own as a definition, as a way of approaching art and so on? Or do you think that abstraction is something uh, ductile that can be adapted to every single different form of abstraction. Could you, say, could you ask that again? Yeah. Again? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The helicopter. helicopter. Can, you can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, the helicopter. <laughs> I have it, it also in my film, and yeah. I had to cut out the scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially the okay. last part of your question, I think, is what we didn't. Here. Okay. Is that, yes, is that right? So, yeah. So the second part was, or is abstraction a concept that has a ductile nature, which allows to be attached to each single different form of art that can be called mm -hmm. abstract? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Anyone want to go after that one? That's my wife, so maybe I should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Full reveal. I, I, I would say both. Yeah. Because, um, you know, there's different, there's sort of working from abstraction in different ways. And I think that uh, I make a little abstract art myself, and I, I tend not to abstract from, from, a, from any form. I just, I'm not even thinking, I'm just doing. And, and I don't know if my work's any good, but I know that other artists do that. They just sort of don't think too much, just go into it, and then other things are taken and morphed out of other ideas. So yeah. I think that you have, uh, I think there's uh, many different ways, again, yeah. of abstraction, and, and I think that's uh, the beauty of it. I, I think that's the beauty of art, you know, that there's so many ways of doing it, so many kinds of interpretations, so I think there's, you know, you, it's, you can kind of attack it any way you want, yeah. and uh, yeah. that would be my answer. Good. Carl had said earlier that a lot of that, when we think of abstractions, a uh, high percentage of it is process driven in response to materials, and I would say in that form that yes, it's, it's applicable in other fields, so in dance, you know, there's a, you know, a long uh, lineage of of dance that's driven by certain uh, movements or, or responses to the function of the body. And, and so, um, and again, in, in other materials, installation art or you know, video now um, and technology, which is just a huge tool yet to transform not only how art is made, but also in terms of how we see, right? So um, in as much as 
the, the putting of, of paint in little tubes so that the Impressionists could go out in the landscape radically changed yeah. and moved us towards <laughs> abstraction. Um, technology, um, AI technology, I would say a lot of the things that I see are pretty terrible right now, but they have this incredible potential to move ahead of us. I mean, artists are, are in this exploration of the unknown, are often uh, predicting where we go in terms of our physical encounter with the world as well as um, other aspects of how our society functions. And so um, it's a very interesting potential there. But Yeah, good. I mean, there's just such plurality, right? Like abstraction is ways yeah. of, they produce, the history of abstraction has produced ways of thinking visually, materially, procedurally, that then get um, pulled into other ways of working. Yeah. 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 Roberta. I kept thinking of three things. Um, one, the recent pictures from NASA of the pillars of creation, uh, which are an abstraction that creates something that isn't. And then I was thinking of calligraphy. And then I was thinking of uh, 11th and 12th century Russian icons, uh, which have an incredible uh, um, abstract aspect to them. I was stunned when I went to the Tretiakov the first, the first time. Well, yeah, I guess it was the first time. And every time since, although I haven't been there that many times. But anyway, but it just took my breath away. These are, they're, they were abstract. And um, often in, in, in Christian circles, especially um, conservative ones, for lack of a better word, and I hate that word, but I don't know how else to say it, um, there's this, there's this uh, kind of fear of um, allergy to whatever abstraction, mm -hmm. as if it's something brought in by Jackson Pollock one day mm -hmm. out there in the Hamptons or something, and mm -hmm. we all know how he died, so never mind. So, um, you know, it's this horrible thing, and yet, you know, my, my, my personal response to that is, well, have you looked around lately? Mm -hmm. I mean, just walk outside. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're surrounded by, by both um, description and abstraction, for lack of a yeah, yeah. better word, and so it, it's a it's a visual language. It seems to me that is that I've encountered all across the world when I've been, you know. So there there's something about it that that describes something about our our perception and our experience of the world. It seems to me, and it crosses a whole lot of boundaries, yeah. and it's a big thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, like <laughs> I'm nuts or whatever. Well, I, well, no, I, no. I, I have had a theory where, especially with um, like icons and in particular, where um, there's this attempt to overlap worlds that um, to show the fusion points between the two and what world? The spiritual world okay. and the material one. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that in order to kind of depict those moments of overlap, you have to invent new things that have never been before. Mm -hmm. And so that mode of, of, of invention, of a kind of straining towards a communication that is other than what is familiar. Um, is a font of newness. And so we see pretty alarming things in icons. Yeah. <laughs> they're very strange yeah. because there's this, again, this strain, this like attempt to um, depict both the familiar and the extremely strange overlapping with each other. And I think the same is true um, of language because we're, trying to, restraining towards um, conveying shared understanding. And we're trying to agree on symbols. <laughs> and we're overlapping worlds, like your world, your world, and my world, and trying to find agreements, a set of agreements. So it's interesting to kind of reverse engineer some of that and see what is happening when 
when artists or linguists, I don't know, who comes up with those first strokes? Who is that individual who tries to write the first A or the first you know, mark that's gonna communicate? Um, you know, it's interesting to sort of uh, deconstruct how those moments happen um, where you're trying to overlap different worlds. And the pillars of creation, like, we're, <laughs> we're rendering for our eyes something that no eyes have seen before, and that is an ultimate overlap, mm. I think. Mm. It's like, of course it's abstract, mm. you know. No one's seen it before, no one's named it, no one's identified these things. Well, and if we, if we had time, it would be worth saying, and I'll say very briefly, that uh, abstraction is deeply woven into the history of uh, visual and uh, um, spiritual, religious, theological ways of thinking. Uh, all through history, the icons, um, Muslim art is, is uh, highly abstract. Uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist, there are lots of images, but the, the um, patterns, the abstractions are highly significant. Uh, Native American art and so on. Um, but also uh, the history of modernist abstraction um, is in a lot of ways founded in spiritual quests and, uh, and theological questions that are co complicated. Um, and a lot of that has, uh, also, is also true of a lot of contemporary abstraction. Um, uh, there's this sort of renewed question of spirituality, the transcendental group, uh, the, you know, and so forth, that is uh, thinking about abstraction as a, as a mode of, some heuristic mode of knowing um, what is non-depictable or unrepresentable. Okay, uh, we are out of time. Thank you very much to the panelists for the conversation. Okay, everybody. Welcome. And time to sit down and, so, and behave differently. Because as someone said to me, and maybe I'll behave, and they said, well, you are behaving. But it's behave differently. At any rate, um, we're really honored. This has been honor after honor this evening um, to have the two people I'm about to introduce. Um, one is a great friend and one is a friend. I mean, I don't know you as well as I know Dana, so um, I don't want to presume, um, Helen. Um, maybe I shouldn't presume about you either while I'm on the subject, but anyway. Be presumptuous. Oh uh, yeah, I'll just go for it. Anyway, um, Dana Joya is an internationally known and acclaimed poet um, and writer. Um, if you haven't read his memoir, Studying with Miss Bishop, I heartily recommend it to you. It is just one of the most delightful books. And I loved it partly because, um, I loved it for a lot of reasons, but one was that in the midst of all the cacophony in which we now live, um, here was a book that had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and and it, was, it was a wonderful book about remembering people who made a difference in someone's life, in particular Dana's. And it, it's, just, it's just marvelous. So do yourself a treat and go buy it and have support Dana. At any rate, um, Dana is also the former chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, where he did amazing things like a program in jazz masters, opera masters, Shakespeare in the schools, um, the big read, which got people all across America um, picking out one book and everybody in town read it and there were events, and Poetry Out Loud, which brought poetry um, recitation back to every state in the country and the winners of each state wound up in the capital and it, it made poetry a public discourse. Oh, they were just wonderful. Um, and Dana is of, it says here, Italian and, and um, Mexican descent, but, but it's Sicilian, isn't it? Yes. Yes, which is, which is different at any rate. Um, and you can do what you want, okay. Um, and also Dana wrote a wonderful uh, ballad about his, he'd be your great grandfather? Yeah. yeah. Um, who, who was shot in a saloon in 
Wyoming, and you can read about that in the poem. Um, it's a wonderful poem, and it's a wonderful story. He wasn't shot because he was the bad guy. He was shot because he was the good guy, so you need to know that. Um, Dana, who was the first person in his family to uh, go to college, got a BA and an MBA from Stanford and an MFA from Harvard, so I guess he did okay. Um, and also, he's just a wonderful person who is devoting his time to his own writing and then also to fostering other writers and other publishers of serious works of art and just came from a conference in Dallas of young writers that's really launched a movement yeah. that's growing and that probably gives him as much satisfaction as anything. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that we had the honor of com commissioning Dana and Sir James McMillan, just to give you a taste, because there will be a salon next June. Um, Sir James McMillan, the composer of some note, um, has written an oratorio, Fiat Luke's Let There Be Light, which will finally be performed uh, um, next, uh, next June by the Pacific Symphony here in Orange County. And the librettist is one day in Joya. So, um, so I, you know, you've got something to look forward to. At any rate, <laughs> Helen Sue's biography is so long I can't begin. Um, she's, she's internationally known as a jazz pianist and composer. She was a 2021 Guggenheim Fellow. Um, she's a native of Houston, Texas. Um, and she, she gave up classical piano for jazz. And um, as a jazz lover, I'm thankful, Helen. Uh, she and Dana have worked together many times. She she's a, did her undergraduate at UT Austin. Um, I, I don't know how to begin. She's got many albums that have been listed on this, that, and everything as great winners. She has taught at Juilliard in Columbia, and um, I don't know where to end. If you want to know, go to Google, okay? Um, go to Google and give yourself 20 minutes. So that's what you need to do. At any rate, it's an honor to uh, have Dana and Helen with us tonight. So, let's go. Uh, am I live? Mic on? Good. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at this reunion. You know, we haven't had a chance to gather this way for, for some time, and it's a pleasure to see you all again and to, to meet uh, new people, including uh, 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 Father Aiden, who said that he gave this Scottish teenager named uh, James McMillan his first break. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, it's a, the, the world is a small world. Uh, culture is a conversation. You see paintings differently, you hear music differently, you hear poetry differently if you're with other people. And if you can talk about it, and if you can uh, engage in a conversation with the artists. Uh, Three years ago, uh, Helen and I performed here and we did her, her album, Sung With Words. Uh, and so we couldn't do that again. It would be hard because the only singer available would be me. Uh, <laughs> and last time, you know, we had you know, five musicians on the stage. So I told her, let's just have some fun. And I'll do some things that I think I, I enjoy. You do some things that you'll enjoy. And, uh, and so it's a great pleasure to be with this old friend of I thought it was 20, but she, correct me, it was 15 years, uh, and collaborator, Helen, whose last gig was at Carnegie Hall, by the way. Uh, and so, you know, it's, uh, you're, it's a treat to hear her. And in her honor, uh, uh, I'm gonna do poems that are really come out of collaboration and friendships. And it's, friendship is so important for an artist, and the friendship of fellow artists, when they invite you into projects, allows you to do things you wouldn't do on your own. And I'm going to begin with a, uh, a poem I wrote for a book. There's a, a fine press printer I know, and he knew an artist who over the years had done all these wonderful jazz woodcut uh, portraits of his favorite uh, jazz musicians, and he didn't know what to do with them. And my, my friend, who's a, a fantastic artist in his own right, said, why don't you let me do a book? And so he asked my brother, who's the famous Joya, uh, to write a, a piece about hearing jazz, and he asked me if I could write a poem about jazz. And I t told him what I, I always tell in invitations, that I'd like to, but I don't know if I can. But this poem came. Uh, I could give you a lot of footnotes to it. All the people that are referred to by first names are jazz musicians. Chet is Chet Baker, Cannonball is Cannonball Adderley. It takes place at an actual nightclub in Hermosa Beach called The Lighthouse. 
Somebody surely in this audience has been to the lighthouse. I mean, good. I mean, you can't all have had respectable pasts. Uh, 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 and uh, the lighthouse uh, band was called the Lighthouse All Stars. There's one classical allusion, Tartarus, uh, which is one of the rivers of the underworld. And so it's one of the names that Romans used to describe the underworld. Uh, it was interesting when the abstract artists were talking because you're talking about procedures and, th and uh, you know, methods. And I have a method, I, it didn't occur to me until they said it, of writing poems, it's like I, I like to put myself physically in a situation either as myself or as an imagined character and have the poem kind of have a lot of things go on physically. This is me talking to my cousin, Philip, who is dead, with whom I used to go to the lighthouse because they never carded us. Uh, and so, but it didn't matter because their drinks were so watery that you couldn't possibly get drunk. So it's called, Meet Me at the Lighthouse. Meet me at the lighthouse in Hermosa Beach, that shabby nightclub on its foggy pier. Let's aim for the summer of 71, when all our friends were young and immortal. I'll pick up the cover charge, find us a table, and order a round of their watery drinks. Let's savor the smoke of that sinister century, perfume of tobacco on the salty night air. The crowd will be quiet, only ghosts at the table. So you, old friend, won't feel out of place. You need a night out from that dim subdivision. Tell Dr. Death you'll be home before dawn. The club has booked the best talent in Tartarus. Jerry, Cannonball, Hampton, and Stan, with Chet and Art, those gorgeous greenhorns, the swinging masters of our West Coast soul. Let the all-stars shine from that Jerry-built stage. Let their high notes shimmer above the cold waves. Time and the tide are counting the beats. Death the Collector is keeping the tab.
after Helen and I had known each other for a couple of years, we got the, the idea of doing an album together. And we uh, thought we could do a jazz song cycle. So Helen you know, uh, applied for a grant, and we got a grant to write a jazz song cycle. And so we asked each other, what is a jazz song cycle? Uh, uh, and so uh, I said, let me write the, the lyrics for the, just try to write a jazz lyric. I wanted to write a poem that did not have any odor of an English department. Uh, you, know, be, you know, because uh, for centuries, for all of human history, poets wrote songs for individual voice and for chorus until they started working in English departments. And, you know, then they sort of specialized to writing, you know, poems that fit on printed pages. And so I wanted to see if I could get a sense of a, of a jazz lyric. So I wrote this, uh, this is the first uh, the thing we did together called Pity the Beautiful. It's a very LA poem, because LA is where the beautiful people come to live off their beauty. <laughs> Pity the beautiful, the dolls and the dishes, the babes with big daddy granting their wishes. Pity the pretty boys, the hunks and Apollos, the golden lads whom success always follows, the hotties, the knockouts, the tens out of ten, the drop dead gorgeous, the great leading men. Pity the faded, the bloated, the blousy, the paunchy Adonis whose luck's gone lousy. Pity the gods, no longer divine. Pity the night, the stars lose their shine.
as I said, when someone uh, asks you to, you know, for a work of art, it sometimes uh, have you create something you wouldn't otherwise. For ye if you know anything about me as a poet, you know I am infamous in American poetry for reviving rhyme, meter, and narrative. The sins that many have still not forgiven me. <laughs> um, and, and I was often attacked, you know, they say Dana Joy with his sonnets and villanelles, and they, you know, as a, an example of my infamy. Uh, the problem is I'd never published a sonnet or a villanelle. And I, and I felt, you know, I wrote a lot in, uh, in rhyme and meter, but I didn't use those forms. And I've always felt bad that, you know, my, my enemies were attacking me, you know, for something I didn't do, so maybe I should do it, which would give some more, more credibility to their attacks. <laughs> uh, and so I was working on a poem, and a friend of mine was doing an anthology of sonnets, and he asked me, do you have one? And I had a poem that was kind of hovering around 14 lines. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna make it 14 lines. And this is the poem. Uh, it has the oldest possible metaphor uh, in poetry, which is the road as the journey of life. The mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. The beginning of Dante, but it, it was old at Dante's time. And once again, the posture is just somebody walking down this road thinking about uh, his journey. The road. He sometimes felt that he had missed his life by being far too busy looking for it. Searching the distance, he often turned to find that he had passed some milestone unaware, and someone else was walking next to him. First friends, then lovers, now children and a wife. They were good company, generous, kind, but equally bewildered to be there. He noticed then that no one chose the way. All seemed to drift by some collective will. The road got easier with each passing day because it was worn and mostly sloped downhill. The road ahead seemed hazy in the gloom. Where was it he had meant to go? and with whom. And this is a poem I would not have read had Helen and I not decided we needed an up-tempo, you know, kind of urban <laughs> number. And so I, you know, I naturally thought of, you know, just these really hot, you know, the, like late, you know, late August, early September in LA, you know, with my folks when they didn't have air conditioning, you know, and everybody's tempers, you know, were on, you know, we're on the edge, you know. Uh, and, and we wrote this thing uh, called Hot Summer Nights. You know, when I wrote it, I, I just thought of it as a song lyric, and, and it was immediately published in an academic journal. <laughs> so what, what do you got here? It's just, it's just having fun. Hot Summer Night. Let's go downtown. It's a hot summer night. Lovers are sitting in sidewalk cafes, making up, breaking up, hooking up, cooking up plans that would leave you amazed. Let's go downtown. It's a hot summer night. Let's not stay home and get in a fight. Let's eat spicy food in some dark little dive and let our bodies know we're alive. Summer is here. The young are on fire. And every tattoo is a word for desire. They're strutting, what is it? They're Strolling as naked as custom allows, they never say later, they only say now. Let's live in the flesh and not on a screen. Let's dress like people who want to be seen. Don't bring me home till the dawn's early light. Let's not waste this hot summer night. <laughs>
I'm now going to read two slightly longer, more complex poems, separated, I believe, by, you know, by a musical interlude. Um, and this is a series of poems that in the form of psalms. Uh, and of the things that we collaborate with, I think the place we live is almost always primary, the, the physical environment in which we find ourselves. And if you're born and raised in Los Angeles, you have a very complicated one uh, because it's a, a place that has not entirely been assimilated by the human imagination. It's grown faster than our cognitive abilities do. And you know, when you think about wh why do we need poetry, um, and I think it's because the way we need all art, it's to delight us, it's to instruct us, it's to console us and to commemorate uh, our lives, our existence. And one of the things that we need to be instructed of most often is how to reconcile our, the reality of our daily life with our imagination. And for, for years I wanted to write a poem about why I found Los Angeles so beautiful. Uh, and then it just came to me. Once again, it's a very simple physical posture. The entire poem takes place in a person who's standing on the Hollywood Hills at night looking at Los Angeles. It begins there, ends there, never really leaves there. It's just about what you see and what you think. It's called the Psalm of the Heights, which in the Bible you call a Psalm of Praise. You don't fall in love with Los Angeles until you've seen it from a distance after dark. Up in the height of the Hollywood Hills, you can mute the sounds and find perspective. The pulsing anger of the traffic dissipates and our swank, unmanageable metropolis dissolves with all its signage and its sewage until only the radiance remains. That's when the city of angels appears silent and weightless as a dancer's dream. The boulevards unfold in brilliant lines. The freeways flow like shining rivers. The moving lights stretch into vast and secret shapes, invisible at street level. At the horizon, the city rises into sky, our demi-galaxy brighter than the zodiac. Surely our destinies are written in this zodiac whose courses and conjunctions govern us. Look down and name our starry constellations, Wilshire, Olympic, Santa Monica. In speeding comets or sleek thunderbirds, we travel the 12 houses of the heavens, ascending Crenshaw, Sunset, or Imperial, Lock in our private worlds of lust or laughter, who will cast the charts of our radiant sorrow or trace the secret transits of our joy? The traffic glimmers in its fixed trajectories, dense and indifferent as nebulae. Though you resist its gaudy spectacle, you can't resist the city's sort of leg. Move away, if you wish, to the white Sierras, or huddle in the smoky canyons of Manhattan. You'll miss the juvenescent rapture of LA, where ecstasy cohabits with despair, lascivious and fitful as a pair of lovers. Let someone else play grown up. Here the soul sings like a car radio and no one asks our age because we're all immortal. <laughs> Inhale the spices of the midnight air drifting up from Thai town and little Armenia. Here on the hilltop, the city whispers to you, come down and play in the traffic. Merge into the moving lights, our myriad, the luminous multitudes that surround you. Join their fiery orbit. Shine with us tonight. 
where else can you become a star? Thank you. The other poem I always wanted to write about Los Angeles, uh, and it came at the same time, was about Los Angeles as a city of the poor, as a Catholic city. Um, and the history of, Cal of Los Angeles is unknown to almost all of the residents of Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, it was first created is really the low rent outpost of the Spanish Empire. There was, uh, you know, 44 families. Uh, not one of them was of pure race. Uh, Los pobladores, the people of, you know, who, the citizens, the, the people of the pueblo, uh, who, who were given it. And it was a, truly an undesirable place. And there was a small river running through it. And still they. Is, still is undesirable. <laughs> Well, it's it's pro let us say it's problematic, David. Um, and 
So this is, this is a, a, a poem which begin a psalm which begins when Los Angeles began, and it ends where Los Angeles is now. Uh, and it's called Psalm to Our Lady, Queen of the Angels. Let us sing a new song to our, let's see, let us sing to our city a new song, a song that remembers its name and its founders, Los Pobladores, the forgotten 44, who built their pueblo beside the small river. They named their river for the Queen of the Angels, Nuestra Señora Reino de los Angeles. Poor, they were forced to the margins of empire, dark, dispossessed, not one couple pure. Let us praise the marriages and matings that created us, desire swifter than democracy in merging the races, Spanish, Aztec, African, and Anglo, forbidden matches made holy by children. I praise myself, a mutt of mestizo and mezzogiorno, the seed of exiles and violent men, disfigured by the burdens they shouldered to survive, broken or bent, their boast was their suffering. I praise my ancestors, the unkillable poor, the few who would dis escape disease or despair, the restless, the hungry, the stubborn, the scarred. Let us praise the dignity of their destitution. Let us praise their mother, Nuestra Señora, the lost guardian who watches them still from murals and medals, statues, tattoos, she has not abandoned her divided pueblo. She has been homeless with a hungry child, a refugee fleeing a brutal warlord, a mother who held her murdered son. Her crown is jeweled with seven sorrows. Pray for the city that lost its name. Pray for the people too humble for progress. Pray for the flesh that pays for the profit. Pray for the angels kept from their queen. Pray in the hour of our death each day, in the southern sun of our desecrated city. Pray for us, mother of the mixed and misbegotten, beside our dry river and the tents of the outcast poor.
Drink some more water to wash down the water that's choking me. Um, I want to finish with 2.1 poems. Uh, the, the, the first one is uh, actually a preview of, of something that Roberta mentioned, is that uh, the Fieldstead Foundation has commissioned a major musical work to celebrate the rededication of the Crystal Cathedral, this beautiful modernist church uh, you know, created by Philip Johnson, which has bec become the Christ Cathedral for the, the, the Diocese of Orange County. And so, <coughs> You know, uh, I wrote the the text for a, a you know an ambitious work that seemed to me that if you if you think of a cathedral basically made out of glass in earthquake country, uh, it's this perfect symbol for faith. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know, you know, and and, uh, and 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 it's it's also a symbol of light. You know, the enlightenment. That our, that our faith provides even in the, you know, the uncertainty of, of, of California in so many ways. And so I wanted to, uh, so we wrote a thing called Fiat Lux. It begins with the creation of light. It talks about this, the city shining on the hill. Anyway, but I felt that we should end the work with a choral hymn. And uh, James McMillan loved that idea, which means you, so let's write something that's absolutely specific to the place and the occasion, but you could take it away elsewhere and it would still make sense. And so I, I, I'm going to just read you the text for the, the closing chorale of this, uh, I guess it's an oratorio technically that we've written, uh, and it's called Cathedral of Light. It, it has to be short lines, very simple diction, very steady rhythm. Cathedral of Light. Upon this rock, our cross and spire, built in a land of quake and fire. Fragile as glass, bright as the air, the angled walls folded in prayer. Under the sun of western skies, we reenact our sacrifice. Bread of the earth, fruit of the vine, the tortured flesh revealed divine. The ancient words fill this new space, redeeming us with unearned grace. Rededicate this crystal spire built in a land of quake and fire. Now the point one poem I'm going to read, and, and I I'm loath to do this, uh, Roberta, but I have to correct you. I don't have an MFA from Harvard. I have an MA from, from Harvard. And I wouldn't mention that except it's necessary for the conclusion of, I think, this very the profound poem I've written. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, it, once again, I was thinking of collaborations. There's a friend of mine, Mike Pike. I don't know if you've, ever, you've met Mike. Uh, and, uh, he came, you know, and he came with me to one of your, one of your early concerts, that I, or early in our relationship. And, uh, Mike created a press, and the first book he published was a book of mine. And this press went on for over 30 years, and then he just was getting too old to do hand printing, so he wanted to end it. I said, well, why don't I write an epitaph for each of us? Uh, and, so, and so it's just this tiny book, you know, with, with something you could put on our graves. And so mine goes like this. Here lies D.G., a poet, who can say? He didn't even have an MFA. Uh, and, and then, you know, finally, this is not a this is not a collaboration. This was a uh, a kind of you know I, I was bringing out my selected poems, and you know I I in general, and I know I'm the only poet I think in the United States that does in general I do not want to write about my family because I have to live with them. Uh, but I felt, you know, it would be a bad thing to have the book and not have a, a poem in praise of my wife. And so I wanted to end, end it with a love poem. And so I, I thought about, there's so many poems about bad marriages. Uh, it seemed to me that we need poems that celebrate a, a good marriage. And 
what it struck me, I mean, a, a marriage is many, many things. It's your life. But it seems to me that the heart of a marriage is an endless, uh, infinite conversation. That you're, you, uh, we lead our lives by the stories we tell about our lives. And you, your story kind of wraps around somebody else's story. And you know you're in love early on because something isn't real until you tell your beloved about it. And so, you know, because you, you want to make it one story. And so, uh, and I think sex is a kind of conversation. I think uh, child raising is a kind of conversation. And a lot of the conversation has words, some of it doesn't. And so I wrote this poem, and it, it's very fragile because this is the most intimate conversation you'll ever have with anyone else in the world, but it's ephemeral. When you lose one person, you lose the only other person you speak that language with. I mean, even your kids can't understand what you, know, you and your spouse are saying. You can, you can talk around them. You know, they, they think they get it, but you know, you're cleverer than they are, at least in this one idiom. Um, and so and it's, it struck me as it's like a, these California Indian languages that only have one or two native speakers left. When that person goes, the songs go, the dances go, the language goes. Marriage of many years. <coughs> Most of what happens, happens beyond words. The lexicon, the lip and fingertip defies translation into common speech. I recognize the musk of your dark hair. It always thrills me, though I can't describe it. My finger on your thigh does not touch skin, it touches your skin, warming to my touch. You are a language I have learned by heart. This intimate patois will vanish with us. It's only native speakers. Does it matter? Our tribal chants, our dances round the fire, performed the sorcery we most required. They bound us in a spell time could not break. Let the young vaunt their ecstasy. We keep our tribe of two in sovereign secrecy. What must be lost was never lost on us. Thank you.
Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Helen. It was awesome. And thank you all for being here. I don't want to say very much because I don't want to end the glow. Um, nah, I, Howard, I, anyway, Howard isn't as love, in, in love with jazz as I am, but I, it's my favorite. Anyway, so I, thank you. Yeah, I know. Let's, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, 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 thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Amundsen's. Anyway, um, Dana, thank you. Thank you, Helen. No, not, na wait. You want, thank you, Helen. Thank you, Dana. And, uh, and thank you all. We'll ask you to grab something to eat, to drink, and join us in the uh, show. And John Silvis, I'll say a little bit, but John Silvis will say most of it about the, the rather remarkable show um, that's there. And uh, uh, thank you all for coming. The next salon is, is November 13, and it will be on a subject which we've all now experienced. It will be Kyle Harper from the University of Oklahoma, who has written a book about the history of plagues. And so, and so I'm sure you will all want to come and add your footnotes, OK? And uh, if, if you've heard him, he was here once before several years ago. He's a good, he's a wonderful speaker, in spite of the fact that he is an academic. So at any rate, um, we look forward to that. So thank you.
um, is, has a very interesting story because when uh, Roberta had uh, selected it, we found out that it was also chosen by Valentino as a design for a couture dress. <laughs> so out of the 30 paintings that he saw, he chose this one. <laughs> And you can't get the dress. You already have the painting. So no, no. Uh, uh, if you saw the price of the dress compared to the price of the painting, you'd be even more adamant that I couldn't buy the dress. Anyway, now that we, the dress costs, I don't know, a lot of times more than the painting. But John explained they put it in an archive and they don't really expect anyone to buy it or something. Yeah, it goes into the Valentino um, archive. They don't usually sell it, so they, they just came up with It was a lot. It was stunning. That's what it was. So, I won't forget that. Anyway, so as I was thinking about this show, I hope you enjoy all the nuance of all the work in the show. And one, one thing that people often say to me is, well, you know, I don't know I could do that. It's so, you know, simple. It was kind of moving me around. So, I hope that you walk away tonight not saying that. Right. So. I, I want to add two, two things. One is, the Lisa Engelbach art painting, um, which is the big one on the wall up above, um, it was it was in a show in New York last spring, I think. And Maya, some of you know, some of you've met her, is a dear friend. Um, but that one is the eighth day, because she did a whole series of the seven days of creation. And then there's the eighth day, which the early Christian church celebrated big time, and all the baptismal fonts were, fonts were eight-sided, often um, baptistry buildings were eight-sided, and that's because the eighth day is the day of the resurrection. So I love that painting um, for lots of reasons. The other thing I want to say is a kind of funny, that odd anecdote, which is that Genesis, um, who I've just met, um, we got involved in placing one of her paintings in a rather important gallery. And um, and the, the gallery had to pick which one. Well, I can say, because it's an honor to you. It was for the National Gallery. And um, and they wanted to look at painting, you know, to be able to choose. And so she had three paintings, because there's a long list to get Genesis paintings right now. And, um, and so they did. So I was, anyway, never mind. And so they were, they finally picked one, which has a great story, which you talk to Jess and she could tell you. But um, so the one that was left that we could buy was this one. And um, I'm very happy to have it for a lot of reasons. Number one, it's St. Obed. And in ha ha a number of years ago now, Howard and I bought several of the prints from Chagall's biblical um, prints. And the one that hangs in our bedroom is Ruth and Obed. Ruth and Boaz. And so now we have St. Obed. So it's all together, you know, it all worked out, Genesis. So um, that's kind of a personal anecdote, maybe too much information. <laughs> so uh, please enjoy the show. There's going to be a, a beautiful catalog coming out shortly. Uh, Jennifer Gross wrote an incredible text, so you have to read it. I've read it at least six or seven times. So thank you, Jennifer. So enjoy the... <laughs>